Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. Here is the long-awaited video explaining uh, my new, or, or the new, exposure technique that I discovered. Uh, here we're looking at the back of my camera. Uh, you can see the zebras and the waveform showing that I was clipping. Um, I recorded this with my iPhone, so the video isn't going to be perfect, but it gets the gist. You can see how now the, um, you can see the blue shows the, uh, underexposure clipping or underexposure, uh, which it means that it is 10% or lower. Um, that's what I have it set at. That's pretty much where your noise bed lives, and if it's below that, it's gone. There's no recovering it. So here, what I'm going to do is show you first off what I do. You can see that EV in the center of the screen. That tells you how many exposure stops you are away from white, pure white. So what I'm going to do is get it roughly 0.3 under. Um, that's like kind of like a safe buffer zone to have a clean, a clean image. You can see that there's both zebras telling me I'm clipping and the waveform also reports I'm definitely clipping. But we're going to take a look at that later and explain why or how this works. Now I'm going to stop down so you don't see any clipping anymore and you can see only a couple little spots of zebra and you can see in the waveform I'm not clipping. But you can see that blue where it's under 10% on the bear thing. So let's take this into MLV app and see what it looks like. All right, now that we're here in MLV app, let's take a look at this footage. We have both of them imported. One, This one is the one exposing as if 100% is 100%, and this one is the purposely overexposed. We can see, let's get rid of session on this one. Let's expand this, and we can see that this looks like it is very obviously clear or uh, clipping here. This information looks like it's being lost. Let us quickly apply our anamorphic preset. So, bam, now we have it stretched, and we have our uh, log C and uh, LUT applied. And you can see that it is, of course, still clipped. What I found out playing with uh, MLV app is that if you have highlight reconstruction on, you can actually recover quite a lot of that information. All of that information actually that falls below the 0 .0, uh, uh EV or uh, exposure value. You can recover all of that using highlight reconstruction. Well, how do you do that? It is not by using gamma, which I would have thought initially when I was playing with it, that's what I thought. It's not. If we go up, it's actually exposure. In particular, uh, you can lower your exposure by, that was the wrong button, there we go, 2.35 uh, stops. That will recover the maximum amount of information. Anything less, and you'll still likely have things clipping, anything more and you're just lowering the brightness of the image overall so let's put that in and you can see here's one of the problems that i've run into is that you get this purpling my guess is that 6000 is not actually the white point of 12-bit video so if we play with it a little bit you can see that going down to around 50k ish recovered it 53 54 don't no, 55 is a little too much Something in the 5,000 range recovers it from that whatever. So my guess is that while it defaults at 6,000, that's not where the white point is. Um, possibly because of this um, uh, technique or whatever else, that's not where white point is. But you can see there's some like artifacting here. We can play with it a little bit to try and fix that entirely. So something like right here, looking at the waveform as well, you're seeing this red line. You want to keep that right about where it is. If we go down too much, it begins to clip. But if we hit that sweet middle part, we can get rid of all that pink and keep all of that information. So here we go with a corrected image. And you can see it is really dark because we've darkened the exposure, but all of that information still lives. Um, 
I've played around with different things like upping the gamma um, 0.35, which gets you kind of in the ballpark of where you were originally were without, but without clipping your highlights. Um, but it doesn't quite, it's not the equivalent of exposure. It makes your image more washed out. So what I actually tend to do is just export it the way it is right now. Um, because even as a 422 file, it holds on to all of the information down here in these shadows. Um, just the way that it is. See how we pop shadows here and you can see all that delicious, delicious information. Um, that even in a 422 will still exist exactly the way that it is, uh, even if we export like this. Um, this footage is a pretty good approximation of what it would look like. Uh, the one thing is that the one mistake was that I probably should have stopped down the aperture just that like tiniest little bit more because you can see it's kind of discolored still. And that's one of the wary things about doing this uh, technique is that it, it is easy to accidentally legitimately clip it a little too much and you get a little bit of weirdness. Um, it could be that I'm missing something with how to do this. Um, some specific detail about Magic Lantern or how MLV interprets the footage. Uh, if somebody knows why this happens, even though in the waveform, if we look at it, it looks like there's proper detail here. It still looks kind of off. If somebody knows why, I would love to uh, hear any explanation of why that might be. So let's go ahead. We're going to export this footage. And this footage, um, let's apply our um, preset just the way that it is, um, and then take a look at it in DaVinci. All right, so all I did to these clips is apply a basic color grade that I think works. I mean, it was raining today, but let's go for a Christmassy red since it's December. Or uh, Christmassy blue. What am I talking about? Christmassy blue. Um, look to the footage. So here, this is the one that we purposely overexposed. Um, I kind of got rid of the weird coloring going on in the highlights by using uh, our wheels and take subtracting some red and adding some blue. Kind of did the trick. It looks pretty good to me. Um... But other than that, if we look at like our curves, you can see pretty much uh, increasing it over the over the board, you know, across the board to pretty much put it where we want it to be. Um, if we zoom in 100% and try to carefully move with the touchpad to the shadows so it doesn't zoom, we're at 100%. So that's pretty much pixel for pixel uh, on my display anyway on my MacBook uh, Air. Um, we can see that the shadows look actually really nice and clean and the highlights are, there it goes, set that back to 100 and carefully, oh my goodness, 100%. Used to be able to hold command and have it move, but now apparently if you hold command in 17 and try move, it'll just only let you scroll vertically. And so it's like, I don't know what they did or why, but now I have to be really careful to be able to move around the image without it zooming. But we can see that it looks surprisingly clean. Let's go zoom back out to fit and look at the other one. So here's the one that we like properly exposed. The waveform, pay attention to that, is almost, it's about identical. There, every it, All the information is placed as closely as possible. The other thing you notice is that the back, the bouquet in the, this one that we purposely overexposed is more blurred than this one. And that's because I exposed using aperture. Um, so this one has a clo more closed aperture, so that's why there's more detail in the background, because there's less bokeh. So, same deal, uh, as close to grade as possible, so pretty much I copy-pasted the grade and then modified the curves to mimic the look of this one as reasonably close as possible. Um, so let's zoom in on this one and take a look around this frame. You can see right off the bat, this one is far more grainier and noisier than the last one. So in particular, the highlights, you're not going to see very much of a difference between the two if we back up to this one. So here's where, uh, zoomed in again, 100. You can see where, let's see, where was that splotch? It was really bad. Yeah, we were right in there on it. 
right over. Oh my word, that is getting really annoying. If somebody knows how to get it to not zoom in like that, I would very much like to know. So here's where that splotchiness was that looked kind of bad. In this one that we overexposed, here's the uh, quote-unquote properly exposed image. You can see that the color looks almost identical. This is probably, this is obviously a little teal, as you can see in the waveform, um, which is this. This has got a little bit more blue to it, but uh, otherwise, let's slowly make our way back over to these shadows, because that's the important part. As long as you can capture the highlights without it going over and clipping, you're good. But it's the shadows in this case that we're mainly paying attention to. I very purposely set this up in, in uh, the way that I did so that we'd have a really good contrast. So you can see our highlights way up here and our subject down here in our shadows. To see how it compares the traditional way to expose, which I've been doing up until like about a week ago, versus my new technique that I found out, that I found about a week ago. So this is what it looks like. I'm going to put an overlay so you can see it more detailed. And then this is the one with the new exposing technique. And you can see the image gets so much clearer. The noise is so much better. The noise performance is so much better. And the image is just sharper and more clear. And that's because by exposing the image higher, we were able to keep the noise bed lower, if that makes sense, by utilizing that around two, two and a third stop uh, of dynamic range that exists above what the camera thinks is 100%, we get a much better, cleaner image. If I didn't figure this out, I would be on the cut. I, I would think that this image was useless because of how much noise exists in this main subject. I would probably throw this out as being pretty much useless because it's so noisy and the color is bad and it's washed out and detail is garbage. I mean, these are both shot at 100 ISO, mind you. But looking at this one with the new technique, it looks so clean and good that this is this now becomes usable footage for me. And that's what I've been finding in the last few days. I've been going down, I've been uploading footage, and I'm going to upload more footage that I've been using and shooting because there's a beach not too far away from my house um, that I often walk that there's a lot of times where I know that if I had exposed the way I used to, that there's no way the footage I would have gotten would still be usable or clean because the shadows would be absolutely decimated with noise. But with this, how I'm exposing now, I can get perfectly good, clean images, even from really high contrast uh, situations. Like this in of itself is a really high contrast uh, situation. You're looking at, you know, the sky in the background. Granted, it was an overcast day today versus this uh, this little thing. It's not even a stuffed animal. It was some, It's something you put out, like, in your living room for Christmas time. Um, in the shadows, this is a huge, really, really, really separated image, contrasted image. Um, so, yeah. And that's when, think about this, the Canon, Canon claims that the EOS M has 11 and a half stops of dynamic range. That's right in the ballpark of the A7S II shooting S-Log2, which I happen to have shot quite a bit in the past. When I was at university, that was one of the main cameras I shot was the A7S II and I would shoot an S-Log2. Here's some footage that I shot with it. And when I got the EOS M, I was actually really disappointed because it seemed like the dynamic range was complete crap. Well, it turns out it's actually we're been we have in effect been accidentally underexposing our images by about two and a third stop. Um, and so if you correct for that, which I have no idea why these things like the waveform, the histogram, and the spot meter percentage all report incorrectly at 100% all claim it incorrectly I don't know why 
I would love for that to be fixed so that we see the whole range of the dynamic range as opposed to clipping it at, you know, the, the roughly two-ish stops before actual white. Um, I don't know the technical side of why that is. Maybe there's a really, really good reason why it reports the way that it does that I'm just unaware of. But my hope is that if you guys, you guys, my hope is that you guys can take this information and apply it to how you shoot and get much better images than you currently do, just like I have been. Um, now, with that said, even if you're using this technique, would I recommend, this is one thing I've been thinking about, would I recommend this camera to somebody who's looking to get into filmmaking or, or something like that? No. Uh, unless you're somebody like me and you don't have the budget for anything more, don't get it. You would be better off getting a Fuji X-T2 that shoots 4K at F-Log, e even at 8-bit, or a X-T3 at 8 or at 10-bit 420, or a Sony A7S 2 or even A7S, or a GH4 or 5, then you are to get this, because this is a very shoddy camera that makes it very difficult to shoot with, and... Um, yeah, has inconsistent results. You are better off getting a camera that shoots proper uh, log and that has been tuned properly by the manufacturer. If you're somebody who has a camera like that, say like the Black Magic, whether let's say you have the BMP CC 4K and you want something to screw around with, sure, go ahead. 100, 100 to $150 you can get an EOS M and have a, a grand old time playing with it and seeing what you can get. Um, but if you can afford something better and that's what you're thinking about right now, if you're one of those people and you're watching my video to see what you may or may not want to get, don't get the EOS M. Skip the EOS M, get like even the original Blackmagic Pocket camera. You're going to get better, more consistently better results from that than you will from the EOS M. The EOS M is either a necessity or a toy. It's not something that you get to use for all of your projects. And I would say that that's the mistake. You're better off, again, getting a GH5, getting a, a Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 4K, getting an X-T3, getting um, an A7S 2 or 3 if you can swing it, something like that, than getting the EOS M. Um, uh, my plan right now is once I can afford getting a... a um, Fuji X-T3, I'm going to jump up to that and very likely sell the EOS M because it's a fun toy and all, but I don't see myself shooting anything very serious on it because of its limitations. But let's, you know, thinking about it, if the EOS M could shoot consistently solid, good dual ISO without getting any flicker or having any glitches or anything like that, I would probably continue shooting the EOS M and shoot it for something serious because the dynamic range from the dual ISO is so, so good that if there was a way to get a consistently good dual ISO output, I would probably keep the EOS M. But in my experience, it's it's glitchy. Um, it's harder to focus, especially with the anamorphic, because you're losing half your res your ver your horizontal resolution. Um, there's, of course, a bit more aliasing because of that as well. Um, sometimes the camera will just pretty much refuse to record. It'll just show you a... Um, uh, it'll like glitch and like drop frames or whatever and then have the like command line come up and then you have to restart the camera but that doesn't always fix it sometimes you know only god knows what's preventing it from being able to record other times it's like horribly bad flicker that's just ruins the image beyond any kind of repair and there's like not really a good way to to predict when it's going to happen, if you're going to have flicker or if you're going to have some other glitch happen, you know, or whatever. Um, 
while I'm ranting or, or rambling, uh, one of the other reasons I would say not to get the EOSM if you're looking for a serious uh, recorder is because of one thing that happened to me is I, 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 I have always been shooting 14-bit lossless up until recently. I record at 1280 by 1066 so that when I stretch the anamorphic, I get a 2.4 aspect ratio. Um, and up until a few days ago, I was able to record that 14-bit lossless at that resolution with the two times uh, anamorphic stretch preview perfectly fine with no issues. But then a few days ago, it started giving me issues, and it wouldn't be able to record. And it was saying it was the, the lines that would come up for the error code were something about compression issues. And so I tried putting it down to 12-bit lossless, and that solved the problem. It started recording just fine without issue. And so I can't really compromise the resolution any lower than it is currently unless I want to go down back down to 960 uh, vertical resolution, which then results in a 2.66 aspect ratio, which is like super wide, um, which is why I upped it to 1066. Um, otherwise, I can't shoot 14-bit, which is really a shame. I don't know if I'm missing something. Maybe it's just something stupid. I could try doing the overclock. That's one thing I haven't tried yet. But it's things like that that just, like, stop you in your tracks. Like, if I, I was out at the beach shooting something when it started doing that, so it was, you know, inconsequential. All I had to do was screw with it until it started recording again and I could go. But if I was on a film set or doing a documentary or something, that would be you know, detrimental to the, to the shoot, something like that happening. Um, so that's another reason I would say to stay away from the USM if you're looking for something serious. Um, but with all of that said, I hope that you guys have a fantastic day. I hope that you guys learned something from this and can apply it. I would love to see some stuff that you guys shoot, um, using anything that you've learned from me. I would love to hear it. Um, and I hope you guys have a fantastic day.